Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. The following production is part of the We Be Geeks Podcast Collective. Beyond the edge of reality lies a story of ultimate conquest, a story of war and friendship, a story of a love that can never be, and a hatred that always was. And now, the most anticipated epic adventure of the year will never come to a theater near you. Final Fantasy VII. From days long ago, from uncharted regions of the universe, comes a legend. The dream that came through a million years, that lived on through all the tears. It came here, the Fandom Nexus. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to our host as he plugged in his microphone. I have a podcast! Here he is, your spider pan, Jeremy. Hello, I am back. Uh, did y'all miss me last week? Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get anything recorded. I it, It's the difference of whether or not I drive myself to a work by myself or if I take my wife to work and then I go to work because then I have to pick her up afterwards and I get home kind of late. And I guess I, you know, I was trying to do that. Sometimes I think I'll be saving money that way, but I'm not sure if I'm really saving money. But I get home kind of late when I do that and I was hungry and I was tired and I was actually working on some video projects which you can see the fruits of those labors on our YouTube channels, mainly the uh, the Neverland Gaming official channel, because uh, I've been recording video of what I've been playing this week, which, of course, I am continuing to play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. In fact, right now I'm on a second playthrough because I have completed it. Not the, so much in the completionist sense of completing it, but I've completed the story and got a lot of did a lot of, you know, with the map and everything. Uh, and so today we're going to discuss Final Fantasy VII back from 1997, and we're even going to review and talk about Rebirth. And I will warn you when I get to potential spoilers, because everybody's got their theories about the ending of that game. And I'm going to share my thoughts when we get there, of course, we're, you know, after we talk about giving some memories to back to the 1997. But that's where things kind of went south on me a bit last week, so I thought, you know what, maybe I'll just take a week off. And so I did. Uh, sorry about that if you missed me. Which, which, if you missed me, you know what, I appreciate that. Uh, but I'm back again this week. We're going to have some fun together. And I think overall, you know, for the last few weeks, I've kind of foregone the having any news or anything like that or even playing any trailers or anything. We've just I've just been sharing some audio with you uh, from Planet Comic Con. And some I think I even have shared from years past, like last year, that I, I don't think I, I remember to share with you because uh, I have found some, some easier methods for me to edit out some language that pops up. Uh, in some of these panels, yeah, sometimes these celebrities, uh, they'll curse, and I try not to have that in the show. So <laughs> so I had to do uh, some tricky things, and I managed to edit some stuff. And uh, so we'll have some more some more of that audio upcoming. But I wanted to get back to more of the normal flow of things, except for, you know, I'm not really going to dive into any news or any movie trailers, although I will at least mention. Uh, and if, if you are a member of the, the Facebook group for uh, for the Fandom Nexus, I tend to share a lot of news there. We do have a, a page that you can like, but it doesn't always get everything. It's easier for me to update the group. I don't have to actually go and log in a different thing and stuff. But So if you get into our group, uh, and then, of course, you're allowed to discuss things. I even have questions that pop out through the week that you can jump in there and talk about different fun things. Uh, but I've been sharing different news stories I find there. And uh, occasionally I share a trailer. And But the trailers that I found this week that I thought were interesting, one of them was like there's a Beatles document, or not a Beatles, but a Beach Boys documentary coming up on uh, Disney+. Plus. And really, it's got a lot of Beach Boys music. And really, that's just going to be a copyright issue altogether for if I put it into the podcast. So I figured, well, maybe we better not do that. The other trailer, I really can't play with the audio, not to mention we don't cover R-rated films anyway, but the uh, trailer for Deadpool and Wolverine had lots of F-bombs in there, so there's no way I'm playing that trailer for you. Thank you very much. 
So whether you're excited for that or not, uh, yeah, we're not going to discuss it here. So uh, the only thing I had for news, though, this week that I definitely want to discuss is, uh, or, or at least want us to bring up uh, is the, the passing of Warwick Davis's wife. Uh, I, you know, I haven't given into the details and everything. I do have the article up on the Facebook group. Uh, so I haven't do- dove into why she died or what happened or anything like that. Uh, it's I just wanted to share that it had happened. And so <clears throat> pardon me. Ooh, a little tickle in the throat. Pardon me. Get a drink. Just wanted to have, you know, our thoughts and prayers, you know, if you happen to be a praying person, which hopefully if you're listening to this show, you might be. So, so we've kind of gone some new directions in this, uh, but uh, just kind of uplift him and his family. I mean, he still has some children uh, and, uh, you know, losing a family member, a close family member like that is it's it's not easy. Uh, in fact, we're good. It's a, a bit of an issue we'll we'll deal with later on in the show, I suppose. There's. There's some conversation that happens like that in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth that uh, might be a bit apropos. Uh, and I, I've got some clips I plan to share with you. And so uh, we'll get to that here in a bit. Uh, but really not going to dive into the normal stuff. I'm just going to get into some main content before we do it, though. I, you know, because it's on the list of things, I do want to remind you at NeverlandPodcast.com. That's our website. And you'll find a giant dubby. Dubby is where you can get energy drink, and it's you can order like a drink powder in different flavors. I think you can even get some cups, but uh, it's energy, healthy energy, not going to give you the jitters, and they really, really recommend it for gamers, which, hey, if you happen to be a gamer, you're going to love this episode because we're going to talk all about one of the best games ever. So, <laughs> so Dubby there, like, have lots of different flavors, and you get a discount if you go through my link there, and uh, I believe if you can enter a discount code on the website, Neverland is the discount code. So enter that and you get a discount off of your order. So definitely go check that out. W.GG is the website. It's a lot easier. Probably just go to my website, NeverlandPodcast.com and click on the giant W logo. Also, while you're there, you'll find the Podgagement logo there, of course. And if, if you happen to have a podcast, you can get right in there and get all of your reviews right there on the website. Uh, well, right there, sent to your email and stuff like that. It's, it's, you know, it's a whole different thing. You can go check it out, but Podgagement is a great service. Okay, well, let's get into it. So back in 1997, January of 1997 is when this released. And, uh, you know, I you heard the trailer there at the beginning of the show, There was, or one of the ads. This, um, really, I believe it was the first very cinematic game that, uh, uh, that we got. I mean... As far as good storytelling, we'd had some games that actually had some really good storytelling. I mean, things really picked up on the Super Nintendo with with Metroid Three or Super Metroid, uh, the third in the Legend of Zelda games, Link to the Past. The ability to tell story was really increased, I think, with the Super Nintendo because you know they, they could do a bit more with music. They could fit more content into the, the games, the cartridges. Uh, it just seemed like it it went further than, and, you know, I mean, there were some pretty good story to games on the, on the regular Nintendo, but I don't know the super Nintendo, it just seemed like it really stepped up, at least in my opinion. And for me, um, it, it just really was that much better. But in order to have like the full, uh, animated style cutscenes, this was a new thing with final fantasy seven. And I mean, this, this was a precursor to, you know, stuff like metal gear solid, which was a very cinematic game, but, uh, the story on Final Fantasy VII really captivated a lot of people. The ads were fantastic, uh, and this—I uh, mean, I myself, I was not a, a main Final Fantasy fan at the point. I had only played uh, on Super Nintendo here in the states. It was Final Fantasy II, but it was actually the fourth in the series. Uh, there, I have seen where there's a bit of a complicated history where uh, Square at the time, but now it's Square Enix, they. They had a rocky relationship a little bit with Nintendo, and Nintendo didn't think that that was a really big seller having the Final Fantasy, so they didn't really license things. And, I, and there's a complicated story that I, I did hear once about that. And so they had a few games that didn't get released, but to save on complications, by the time they got up to the to recount and get everything back up to the main numbering, uh, back to seven, so a lot of games were skipped and weren't sent over here to the United States. Sony, uh, of course, Japanese company, uh, was very much willing to have it become a, a PlayStation exclusive on this franchise. And now a lot of those old games you can get, they've repixelized, uh, and you can you can get collections of the classic Final Fantasy games for your PlayStation. Of course, you can get the original Final Fantasy if you happen to get the old NES Classic, which I do have. Uh, and that is on there. It is odd for me that you name all the characters yourself and they don't come with names. And so, 
you know, you see a lot of things that developed and came around later. Uh, but I found a lot of a few different articles and different things. Now, let me just read some of this for you off of Wikipedia. Uh, this is a, of course, 1997 role playing game developed by Square for the PlayStation console and the seventh main installment in the Final Fantasy series. Square published the game in Japan and it was released in other regions by Sony Computer Entertainment, becoming the first game in the main series to have a PAL release. That's important for you all out there in Europe. <laughs> The game's story follows Cloud Strife, a mercenary who joins an eco-terrorist organization to stop a world-controlling megacorporation from using the planet's life essence as an energy source. Events send Cloud and his allies in pursuit of Sephiroth, a superhuman who seeks to wound the planet and hardens his healing power to be reborn as a god. Small g. During the journey, Cloud bonds with his party members, including Aerith Gainsborough, who holds the secret to saving their world. Development began in 1994, originally for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, after delays and technical difficulties from experimenting with several platforms, most notably the Nintendo 64, which that's where actually where they were developing by this time as they were looking at the Nintendo 64. Square moved production over to the PlayStation, largely due to the advantage of a CD-ROM format. Veteran Final Fantasy staff returned, including series creator and producer, and this is where I'm going to stumble over a, a Japanese name, so I apologize in advance. Huronobu Sakaguchi, director Yoshinori Katasi, and composer Nubuo Yumatsu, which I have said in a lot of different times. He is like the John Williams of video game music, and I've seen that actually written up. And I hopefully I've got this on my list. I was re- when I was doing my research, there was actually a college professor who said the same thing. So I feel that gives me some credentials to that. Uh, the title was the first in the series to use full motion video and 3D computer graphics, featuring 3D character models superimposed over 2D pre-rendered backgrounds. Although the gameplay remained mostly unchanged from previous entries, Final Fantasy VII introduced more widespread science fiction elements and a more realistic presentation. The combined development and marketing budget cost around $80 million U.S., the Final Fantasy VII received widespread commercial and critical success and remains widely regarded as a landmark title, and it is regarded as one of the most influential and greatest video games ever made. The title won numerous Game of the Year awards and was acknowledged for boosting the sales of the PlayStation and popularizing Japanese role-playing games worldwide. Critics praised its graphics, gameplay, music, and story, although some criticism was directed towards the original English local- localization. Its success has led to enhanced ports on various platforms, a multimedia subseries called The Compilation of Final Fantasy VII, and a high-definition remake trilogy currently compromising or comprising Final Fantasy VII Remake and Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, they don't seem to mention the Crisis Core game, uh, which was called you know, Final Fantasy VII Reunion. Uh, it... They just kind of remastered it from the uh, original game uh, from the it was a handheld on. The, oh, the, what was the the Vita? I believe was the PlayStation handheld. Uh, so I, I was glad that they ported that over to PlayStation five and remastered it because it gave me a chance to play it. But you could tell from the animation that they did not tweak it at all because everybody's kind of got like that. The, the awkward turn they like you would see in the classic, the old original Resident Evil games where you might be doing a tank turn, that kind of thing where you're kind of almost stationary and you just kind of kindly turn to the left, that kind of thing. Uh, which, speaking of you know having like the 2D pre-rendered backgrounds, that, of course, first time we really got a good look at that was Resident Evil, where we had 3D polygonal characters moving through a 2D pre-rendered background. And that, I mean, that, I think, really showed me some of the capables of, of, of capabilities of a PlayStation. That was even before I bought one, but I got a, a chance to sample Resident Evil at a, a Baptist Student Union event. And uh, I mean, it just kind of blew me away because you had a fully filmed opening and uh, a fully developed story on that that was far beyond anything I had ever played. Because you know, all you PC gamers, you know, were getting all everything on a CD-ROM and you were having all this type of stuff. But I'm more of a console gamer, so I wasn't getting anything like that. So then, of course, this game, Final Fantasy VII, comes out and. Now, I am not one that, uh, in, in my earlier years, I didn't have the patience to sit there and do menu commands for combat. I, I prefer more of an action RPG type of thing, like The Legend of Zelda. And I do adore most of The Legend of Zelda games. I haven't played all of them, and there have been some that I didn't really enjoy. Breath of the Wild actually being one of them that I really didn't enjoy that. Uh, I mean, I can see why it would be enjoyable, but I did not like my weapons breaking all the time. And I got really sick and tired. There was way too many of these... Uh, the mini temples where you're actually trying to upgrade your, your heart containers 
and your endurance, which is also an annoying thing, having that endurance meter on that, uh, which some people enjoy that type of mechanic, but it felt more like a normal, like a there's survival games out there where you have to regularly eat and stuff like that. And I don't really, that doesn't appeal to me where you have to regularly maintain yourself. And I felt like I had to do that because I had to go through it and learn how to cook things in Breath of the Wild in order to get my health up. Uh, and the thing is, is when you'd figure out a recipe, it didn't save that recipe for you to say, oh, here's a thing you've made before. You had to, you know, do it manually every time. And there was just a lot of things that, you know, maybe they perfected by, uh, this last game, but as much as having an open world, that's fine. But I just didn't like the mechanics of it. So I'm sorry. I just didn't enjoy Breath of the Wild as much. I mean, otherwise, I mean, it's got a lot of great stuff about it, but I know some of the mechanics just bothered me. I'm glad I finished it though. But, you know, that's more my style. I'm an action RPG type player. So having a menu thing, even though uh, when I was playing what we called Final Fantasy 2, which is really the fourth one, the story, when I when I I'd borrowed that from uh, actually Philip's sister's boyfriend at the time, I had borrowed it from him because he said, oh, you'd love this. And he, he loaned me that in Secret of Mana. I didn't complete either one of them because, like, I don't have that kind of time and I need to get him back because I don't know how long he's going to be a boyfriend to, to uh, Philip's sister there. So I was like, he could be gone at any time, but then I'm not going to see him. And I don't want to end up like, well, let's talk about this game. Then I can't get into him. Oops. Sorry. So uh, I didn't. Both of them were Square Enix games and the stories were really fantastic. And I really would like to sit down and play Secret of Mana. The only thing that I struggle with Secret of Mana is even though it was more of an action RPG between your your sword strikes, you had to wait. It's like it had to recharge a little bit. So you couldn't just whap, whap, whap like you would in Legend of Zelda. You had to smack smack you know and you had that, that delay and doing the menu commands for the combat in uh and the other one plus having it random encounter uh i that was it's not really something that appealed to me at the time granted now i've played stuff for you know i have played through seven and completed it so uh in my later years i have but uh so that was kind of an awkward thing for me playing final fantasy seven uh, so, but I, I, there was a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz going around that game. And sometimes that's why you buy something because there's a lot of buzz. You're like, okay, well, this looks like it's going to be really cool. So let me try this out. And so I remember I, uh, I pre-ordered on that. And so I got that, got Final Fantasy seven back in 1997 in January, uh, as it released and, you know, got it home and played it. And wow, the music kind of blew me away, uh, right away. I mean, the music was great, but, uh, early on. Yeah, Aerith actually became my favorite character of that game. She wasn't my overall, as as it is now, she's my overall favorite video game character ever at this point. But at the time, she was my favorite character because I liked that, uh, you know, of course, she's she's kind of fun when you meet her out in the street. But then when you finally get to really, you know, inter- interact with her more, she's in a church. And I was like, hey, I like that. And she liked flowers and she's a praying and she's a faithful type person. And it's like, well, you're the closest thing to a Christian we have around here. And I liked her personality and stuff. And I, I really enjoyed the character. Well, then as I'm playing along and slowly, you know, grinding my way, because I was a college student at the time and I was also working. So, you know, I didn't have all the time in the world to play. But uh, I, I used to subscribe to a lot of gaming magazines. This is, you know, back in the early days, of the Internet. And you did you couldn't just look up everything in the Internet. You would get gaming magazines so you could find all these things. And you'd get reviews of games. You could hear about upcoming games by reading these magazines. But they spoil spilled the beans on a crucial uh, event. Now, OK, we're over 25 years since this came out. So I guess it's OK that I can tell you that Aerith was no, known as Eris when we talk about, by the way, the the mentioning of the localization problems. Uh, Eng- it didn't. They didn't translate very well to English. Everything, and she was accidentally called Eris. And there, some people still stick to that. That you know, they don't like to switch back over to what her name was meant to be. I, I had an easier time switching over to that. Um, but you know, she gets killed like at the end of the first disc, and it is a major game changer. Uh, and it's a very sad. But finding that out, and I was like, oh, but I really liked that character. I kind of was depressed. And, you know, all the random encounters, I'd, I'd already I'd been out in the main map and I'd done so much stuff. I was like, golly, I don't know if I want to go to that point. I, you know, I'd rather that not happen. And if I get there, you know, I, I, I found, of course, there was nothing you do about it. I mean, there's two major things in the late 90s with video games that gamers were trying to do. One was trying to get the clothes off of Lara Croft. And the other number two was trying to find ways that you could save Aerith. And even people found a glitch that if you went into Midgar and opened the doors of the church for briefly, you could see her there tending her flowers inside the church, which I have tested out and seen that you can get it to happen before you've even met Aerith. You can wander into the church and open the door and and she'll briefly there and then she'll disappear. 
Uh, but if you go back in any other time, it won't happen again. But a lot of people took that as like, oh, it's like visiting and you can see her ghost is there or something. And uh, when they moved it to PC, a lot of people modded the game to get where Aerith was part of your party throughout the time. But you had to be careful that she wasn't a part of your party when you entered a cutscene because it could cause the game to crash because she would, you know, pop out to interact, but she's not supposed to be there. So but people were uh, really uh, highly affected by that, uh, myself included. Uh, probably even more so now as we've gotten the re- remake, uh, which I was very much excited about, uh, I must say. So let me read some of the other bits of information. Uh, Final Fantasy VII takes place on a world referred to in-game as the planet and retroactively named Gaia. The planet's life force, called the Life Stream, is a flow of spiritual energy that gives life to everything on the planet and its processed form is known as Mako. On a societal and technological level, the game has been defined as an industrial and post-industrial science fiction setting. Uh, I've heard some people call it like kind of steampunk, the way things looked. Uh, And during Final Fantasy VII, the Shinra Electric Power Company, a world-dominating megacorporation headquartered in the city of Midgar, is draining the planet's life stream for energy, weakening the planet and threatening existence and all life. Significant factions within the game, including Avalanche, an eco-terrorist group seeking Shinra's downfall so the planet can recover, the Turks, a covert branch of Shinra's security forces, Soldier, an elite Shinra fighting force created by enhancing humans with Mako, and the Cetra, a near-extinct human tribe which maintains a strong connection to the planet and the live stream. Uh, we, there was a lot of different fun characters, and uh, you even get uh, later Zach Fair. Uh, you, you kind of hear about him as Aerith's first love. Uh, he eventually did get his own game. The Crisis Core game that I was talking about before is kind of his story. Uh, so uh, he apparently, uh, I missed out at the time. I've gotten to play it later, but he came, became a very popular character because as you play as him, he's very likable. He's a fun guy, uh, and I really enjoyed Zach. Uh, he is a fun character. So if you haven't played Crisis Core, if you've played these other games, you need to go back and play Crisis Core. It's very, very good, and it is available on your PS5. So if you're an Xbox player, um, sorry. <laughs> Initial concept talks for Final Fantasy VII began in 94 at Square Studio following the completion of Final Fantasy VI, and as with the previous installment, series creator Horonobu Sakaguchi reduced his role to producer and granted others a more active role in development. These included Yoshinori Kitasi, one of the directors of Final Fantasy VI. The next installment was planned as a 2D game for Nintendo Super Nintendo Entertainment System, but after creating a, an, an early 2D prototype of it, the team postponed development to help finish Chrono Trigger, and once Chrono Trigger was completed, the team resumed discussions for Final Fantasy VII in 1995. Now, Chrono Trigger, I can't remember if I... I don't think I've played through all of it, but I can't remember if I played some of it. So when I, when I see screens of it, something's familiar about it, but I don't recall that I've played it. And if I get the opportunity to do so, I feel like I would like to go and play Chrono Trigger because I've heard a lot of good things about that game as well. The game's art director was Yusuke Niora, who had previously worked as a designer for Final Fantasy VI. With the switch into 3D, Niora realized that he needed to relearn drawing as 3D visuals require a very different approach than 2D. With the massive scale and scope of the project, Niora was granted a team devoted entirely to the game's visual design. The department's duties included illustration, modeling of 3D characters, texturing the creation of environments, visual effects, and animation. The Shinra logo, which incorporated a kanji symbol, was drawn by Niora personally. Promotional artwork, in addition to the logo artwork, was created by Yoshitaki Amano, an artist whose association with the series went back to its inception. While he had taken a prominent role in earlier entries, Amano was unable to do so for Final Fantasy VII due to commitments at overseas exhibitions. His logo artwork was based on Meteor. When he saw images of Meteor, he was not sure how to turn it into a suitable artwork, and in the end, he created multiple variations of the image and asked staff to choose which they preferred. The green coloring represents the predominant lighting in Midgar and the color of the life stream, while the blue reflected the ecological themes presented in the story. It's coloring directly influenced by general coloring of the game's environments. And of course, another prominent person was Nomura, you know, uh, the the, the music writer. Oh, well, I guess Nomura is not the music writer. It's Noboa. Uh, But let me go back to my notes here and see uh, where did I put all these articles I'd saved up? I guess I didn't grab the links, but uh, yeah, there were articles about the music and oh my goodness, the music is fantastic. And having the opportunity to come back and remake these this game into a trilogy, uh, giving them a chance to orchestrate and have a few other composers kind of step in and, and flesh out some extra things uh, has really been great. I have uh, got both of the soundtracks and I enjoy listening to them. They're very good. I used to like to listen to film scores anyway, and this is very, very much similar in fashion to that. 
So uh, I want to move on to the next part of the next segment I want to go to. This will be, I'd say, mostly spoiler free. But we're going to talk about why Aerith is a favorite character for me. And before I do that, I want to play another one of the ads that were on television for the original game. More than 200 animators and programmers. A multi-million dollar production. Over two years in the making. And a cast of thousands. They said it couldn't be done in a major motion picture. They were right. Final Fantasy VII. All right, so now I do actually have, uh, well, actually two videos that are up now. I just uploaded a second one, uh, one that I called "Why uh, Aerith being your favorite character for an hour and a half. And if you have the time to watch that one, I do recommend it. You know, it's 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 fun. If you're not familiar with these games, uh, I, I tried to make sure that you know, you're not really getting the story of the game, but you're getting enough of her character. I think you're going to like her. And I just uploaded another one that I had a few clips that I didn't use in that video that I remembered from Rebirth that I wanted to share. But they're all up on the official Neverland Gaming channel. Uh, I'm also putting this stuff up on my YouTube channel of The Spider Pan. Uh, you can find those both on YouTube. You can find these videos. Uh, but we're, I've got some audio that I want to share with you as we we walk Mark along. But I've, I've made a list of reasons of some of the things that I enjoy. Uh, but really, as, as we first came along, I found her to be actually pretty relatable. Uh, in the original game, but of course, as our story goes on, I'm actually I th- I feel like she's learned a few uh, I've learned a few things from her, and so she's actually become one of my fictional heroes. And of course, my fictional heroes include like Spider Man, and what, you know, what's the main thing I've always said that I've learned about? Of course, the I know it's cheesy, you you heard it before, but with great power comes great responsibility. I mean, that is the biblical parable of the talents, uh, and that really has stuck with me, and I've always remembered that that no matter what it is that you can do, you've got a responsibility to do it. And if, if you have a, you know, if, if the Lord's given you 10 talents versus five talents or even one talent, if you've got 10 talents, that's a great power and you have a greater responsibility to make use of that. And uh, I try to be worthy of, of the talents that God gives me and I'm trying to share them and do them right now with you and finding things to hopefully encourage you uh, and get you a few lessons. Uh, but I do have an audio clip of a lesson learned from Aerith. Um, and uh, it's basically because, you know, I, I when I was a kid, I was very temperamental and it took me years to control that temper. But uh, I think I, I found a very good way of how Aerith kind of controls her, her. You know, she's it's it's OK to be angry. Right. It's, it's just an emotion. But uh, the Bible teaches us to be angry and sin not. And uh, there was a very fine example in Rebirth of that. If you don't mind, I'd like to be alone. Are you angry? Mm hmm. At me? Not at you. At everything. Must be nice. To have a friend you've known since you were a kid. Someone you can say, remember the time when? To someone you can reminisce with. I don't have anyone like that. And it feels like I'm being taunted for it. Which stings. More than it should. That is why I want to be alone. Plus, I might take it out on you. And I don't want that. I don't mind. Well, I do, and it'd only make me feel worse. Thank you, though. Really. I'll be down in a bit. See you then. But she's also a very funny character, and when we first get to spend some time with her in uh, in, in Remake, uh, we see that accidents seem to just keep happening to her. And uh, that just kind of makes her funny. But uh, there's, there's definitely one point that... Uh, it's probably funnier than most that happens in Rebirth, and I definitely want to share you some of the audio. Um, and uh, it's funny because she's she's called a princess kind of insultingly uh, by Reno, one of the Turks. Uh, and but she's she's she says directly that she does not want to be coddled. Uh, but despite though, she does need a hand and needs some help once in a while. And it's always appreciated that Cloud or Tifa is usually there for her when she needs them, and I appreciate that. And uh, I, I've, I've I don't think I've, I've I've probably get to this later, but I have mentioned on other occasions to other people and I've posted that Aerith in some ways does remind me of my wife. There are some similar personality traits, especially the the love of the flowers and stuff like that. Uh, there are some similarities between the two and the playfulness that uh, well, my wife is actually in one of her playful moods today and everything. And I appreciate that, but she's, I, I, I find some similarities between the little bit, just the little bit of playful sass that Aerith has is very similar to my wife. 
Uh, and it's nice when that comes out. And I've seen some of that come out. And uh, she's got some funny stories where she had sass that for people who deserved her, uh, her just the right level of sass. So my, my wife is pretty awesome. Um, and so is Aerith with that same amount of lovable sass. But uh, well, with all that being said, with her being funny, here is actually probably my favorite one. Of, well, okay, let's, I'll play a couple of clips for you of how Aerith is actually pretty funny, some of the things she says and some of the things that happened to her. And that's the final word on it. We'll get home quick and eat ourselves stupid. You still holding up okay? Yeah, feeling great, actually. Could do this all day. It's like, it's like someone's pulling me up. You've become one with the mountain. Say what? Really? I did? Hey! Thanks for having me! The hell are you doing, Red? Relax. Happens to all the cars. If she passes out, I'll carry her. Let's go! She's more powerful than she seems, and she has confidence in her ability, but she also has a humility. And she harbors a few doubts, uh, which uh, helps her be relatable. I mean, even if you're really talented at something, the average person is like, you you feel like you have imposter syndrome sometimes, and that, that almost seems to come out. And uh, she gets called, you know, homely and plain at different times in the remake and everything. But, you know, but she's definitely got an inner beauty. And, heck, if you look at the character model, she's not ugly. I mean, for crying out loud, getting called ho- homely and stuff like that. And uh, But she kind of takes it all in stride. She notes it, but uh, it's very funny. The fu- one of the fun things about her, she, she tends to get what she wants, she, and she doesn't really take no for an answer. But it's interesting, she doesn't do this in sort of a pushy way. Uh, we're, we live in the world here in the States where we have girl bosses being kind of the standard of women who are going to go after and get after they want, and that's what a strong woman is supposed to be like. But strength comes from other sources. Uh, in fact, she's got a very great uh, lesson to teach about strength and where, where one of the greatest strengths are. And uh, I, I, I'd like to, of course, share that audio with you, and I will here in just a second. But it's it's the way when she wants something from you, she will get you to gr- agree with her, but not in a manipulative way. But sometimes it's just she'll kind of she kind of ribs Cloud to get him to kind of just get in with her. But she just assumes like if she's not asking you to do anything really terrible, that you're just going to go ahead and go along with her. Uh, and she does this with Cloud, you know, and she doesn't ask you to do anything terrible or, or necessarily, you know, you, she might get you out of your comfort zone, but she doesn't really take no for an answer. But she's she's not bossy about it. She's not pushy about it. She just kind of does her own way that kind of just convinces you to just go along with her. Well, especially with like the eating herself stupid and, and that's, that being the final word on it. But uh, some of the what she talks about the strength, uh, there's a really great and this is a very, I think, biblical lesson here. But let me play that clip for you. Our bodies may disappear when we die, but our spirits still live on. Knowing that the people we love aren't really gone, it doesn't make it any easier to let them go. It still hurts, so we can't just think of it as a homecoming, because it's not that simple. We've all experienced pain. We all have our regrets. What we've done What's been done to us? That's set in stone. The past is forever. But the future, even if it has been written, can be changed. It's true that the pain and the anger we carry can make us stronger. But at what cost? What toll does it take? I believe true strength doesn't come from any of that. True strength comes from our ability to forgive, to forge ahead in the hope of making things right. She's got a very playful spirit, as I was mentioning before, uh, and she chooses to focus on the future and the present. The future is not set, though she seems to have some foreknowledge of, as we mentioned before in the 1997 game, that she's she's kind of brutally murdered. Uh, they're not even in combat in the game, which a lot of people, their their way that they thought that she could have been saved was like, you won't have a phoenix down. A phoenix down is how you bring a character back, but uh, you'll you'll note in the remake, and they're, they're a bit more specific, that a character falls unconscious. They're not dead. And a character that's fallen unconscious, you can use a phoenix down to revive them. If they're dead, though, they're dead. Now, some role-playing games have the character that's killed that you can go to certain locations and have them revived. Uh, I don't know if Square Enix has done that with any of the Final game or Final Fantasy series, as they probably have. Uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head, other than maybe that Super Nintendo one that I played. I might have had that feature but I don't remember. I would like to play that one again and actually complete it because I never completed it. So 
I just didn't have that kind of time. But yeah, so I mean, the Phoenix Down will bring you back from consciousness, but no, won't bring you back if you're dead in uh, in this world, at least of the seventh game in this series. But uh, she makes some friendly jokes with her friends, mainly with Cloud. Uh, she'll kind of do things that are a little bit embarrassing. It's like she says things that are slightly just meant that he'd be embarrassing, but she won't spill the whole beans. She'll try to get him to tell the story because she thinks it's a funny story. It's a little bit embarrassing, but she won't flat out embarrass it right in front of him. But, you know, she does like to tease Cloud about some of the funny things that, and embarrassing things that have happened to him in a friendly way. Uh, and she she does have a very painful past. I, I would kind of mention that. Uh, there we go. Yeah, she does. Like, I, OK, back to the foreknowledge thing that she seems to know what's going to happen. So she has an idea that maybe she can change her fate. We see this at the end of Remake, and I hope I'm not spoiling that. Uh, I was going to have Eric on the show with me. He's gotten to play Remake, but he hasn't gotten very far. But that's one of the themes of these new games is altering their fate. They're trying to change things. So and it's I'll get into a little bit more detail on this later, I guess. But uh, she overall, she just chooses to be happy because happy happiness really is and it can be a choice. If you choose to be happy, other people can add to your happiness. It's a, it's a lot of attitude that you can choose. Now, some people, they can't. Uh, I, I understand depression is a very much a chemical thing, and you can't control that. That happens to my wife. Uh, I know uh, another great podcast, That Story Show, James Kennison, suffers very badly from severe depression. Um, and he just really can't control that. And I mean, well, that is true. But for the most of us, the rest of us, we can choose to be happy, and then everybody can add to that happiness. Uh, but she wears a smile, and even some of the songs written now for these newer games, they have lyrics in there and they talk about the, uh, the darkness hiding behind the smile. Like she can wear the smile despite all the stuff that has happened in her life. And some of the stuff she has and the meaning behind her tears, as it talks about in the song called hollow in the remake game. Uh, there's definitely that thing, but that's that depth of character that she, she chooses to be happy. She's not faking her happiness. She's choosing to be happy and having a, a positive attitude. And she gets excited about things with a new experience. It's like she is counting it all joy. That's another biblical principle for you right there. Uh, and you, you find like, especially in uh, the new rebirth game, she makes a jumping step and says, ah, first step on our new journey. Let's go. She's ex excited about things. And I'm inspired by that attitude. I mean, she's very layered with, uh, of course, the deep meaning behind, behind the tears when they come. And when she does cry, there's there's deep things going on, and you're learning more and more about her uh, in these games. Um, and I do have some, like I said, video on this. You can see all these different scenes, and I think they're really great. And... Uh, yeah, it's just I, she's my favorite character. Now, the odd thing is with Square Enix keeps control of their licensed characters. So they make a lot of their toys and products themselves. And I do like to collect a lot of toys. And normally, like the most I'll pay for something is about twenty dollars, unless it's necessarily big or doubled up or something like that. And I have a few figures that probably cost me about twenty dollars on the wall right now. Some Masters of the Universe Origins figures and things like that. Uh, but to, to order a, a toy of Aerith would cost me about $150. And then, of course, when you ship it, because I have to import it from Japan, it's going to be about $178. I actually am now, after after Rebirth, I, before I was saying, no, no way, I'd never do that. But after Rebirth, and the more de growth and development that this character has had, and the more the effect I think she's having on me, I'm like, you know what? I will spend that money. I do want to have that, because you know, having all these little toys on my wall and the ones that I have out of package, they all mean something to me. They They make me feel good having them around. Uh, I, they make me happy, you know, having all these different things, having all the Mickey Mouse stuff that I have around me. In fact, I've got a new beanbag Mickey Mouse that I found, at, one of them TY ones that I found in a gas station that I had to get for myself because it's just kind of cute and I still love Mickey Mouse, that kind of thing. You know, they all have some meaning to me uh, and I appreciate sometimes just I sit here in my office and I look around at all my the toys hanging on the wall and some of the stuff that I've put out and I've made displays. They just they just make me feel good, you know. Everybody has their thing, and that's that's one of my things. I don't have near as much stuff as Philip does. Philip has he's done some really great displays. He's got like a museum going on. It's fantastic. But it's, it brings back nostalgic feelings of characters that you loved when you, since you were a kid, and be able to get toys, modern toys of characters you loved since you were a kid is fantastic. But Aerith meaning that much to me, I'm like, you know what? I I would like to have a toy of Aerith just to, so I can pose. And uh, I'm not going to keep her in the box like I normally would keep a lot of stuff in the box. Uh, because of it, she comes with a stand and all this extra stuff I pay for and the posability. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take her out of the box. I'll keep the box. But uh, that way I can display her. And uh, I was showing to Philip was like that I was going to do this. And he's actually now now I have to have all the things because there is 
Uh, he sent me links where people were trying to sell old ones that they have a just a statue style version of her. I'm like, oh, that's neat. I kind of want that one. And he even found a figure that's still in like what we would normally expect an action figure to be in like the bubble casing. Uh, one is the more of the 1997 design. I'm like, OK, now I want that one as well. So I'm going to be collecting these, I think, for a while. I'm going to have to save up a bit, though. So but that's kind of the thing. So but I've really enjoyed the character now. Um this is where I'm going to give you the spoiler warning. If you have not completed Rebirth, uh, you, you've been warned. I'm going to work my way into spoiler uh, territory as we go along and giving a little bit of my review here of Rebirth. Um, I got to say, uh, if you play the Crisis Core game, uh, there's a story uh, like a book. It's like poetry or whatever. It's a main story. And there's a, a play of it called Loveless, and you see stuff displayed about it. It's like an in-game thing. And they develop what that is a lot more, but it seems to be prophetic. Uh, and you have a character named Genesis in Crisis Core, like that he he's, he guides his life. It's almost like a Bible in a way. It's like a scriptures to him, and he guides his life around it and has quotes from the book for nearly everything. But you see that some of it is very kind of prophetic to stuff. And heck, the Loveless Plague, you get to perform and be a part of it, and I've actually seen how when I've after completing the game, how some of the stuff that they mentioned in the loveless play does play out a little bit in, in some of the character developments. And I, I thought that was very, very interesting because uh, you, you see uh, cloud basically playing in out in his role. And if you uh, get to go on the 12th chapter date with Aerith, she kind of fills the role that I think was meant for her position as in the fact that there's supposed to be this goddess who, who is gifting these heroes and leading these heroes. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. An evil empire is sucking the life force from the planet. Destroying all that's in its path. It's up to one soldier of fortune to save the world. If he succeeds, you survive. If he fails, you can always hit the reset button. Final Fantasy VII. Only on PlayStation. Well, now there's uh, here. Here's where we get that spoiler territory. Oh, well, let me just go ahead and give the review things that I, I and I've said many times on the podcast. I enjoyed the game immensely. Had a great time. My only thing that kind of bugged me is there's almost too many, too many mini games, and I struggle sometimes with mini games. And in order to get some of the achievements, I have to be able to complete them to uh, to uh, like an almost perfection. And I'm just not going to be able to achieve that. You know, people younger than me probably are great at that mini games, but I'm not. And so I did, you know, that's the one thing that bugs me. And I felt like I got so bogged down with there was, I mean, it's, it's nice to have a lot to do in a game. And I feel like I got my money's worth. I spent a hundred dollars to get the steel book with a soundtrack and an art book. And to me, it was totally worth it. I definitely feel like I'm getting my money's worth out of this game for as much things that there were for me to do. But there was times that I was like, I was doing all this extra stuff and I wanted to complete all the maps and all this other stuff. But I was like, man, I, I feel like I'm losing the story. I need to get back to the story. So it is nice on the second playthrough that I'm like, okay, I won't even turn, because you can have the options to turn on the side quests on or off after you've completed. You're like, do you want to play the side quests again or do you just want to skip them? You know, and you can even change that if you've like, okay, I just have something on the side quest. I didn't get the perfect mark with my relationship with this character. So I want to redo the side quest, but then I can go and, go and alter that and pick a chapter and say, okay, well, side quest done. Now let me go and pick up my best version of it and play it without side quest. But I'm right now I'm playing on a second way through without doing side quest. I don't have to do all the, as much exploring. I can just move on with the story and uh, I'm, I'm still enjoying it immensely. Although some of the presentation has gone in the second time. I really appreciate at one point when you really finally get control of cloud and you're making your way up out uh, up Mount Nebel in a five years ago flashback that the, the main theme kind of comes up in a nice way and credits start kind of appearing on screen very cinematically. And I, oh my goodness, I, that just brought back all the feelings. You know, was, I felt like, oh, I'm, 
I'm walking into a movie or whatever of my own story that I get to participate in. And uh, I always enjoy that type of presentation in a video game where it's very, very cinematic and great storytelling. Because I'm a heck of a the main thing I play games for now is I do love the stories and it's a great distraction and it does make me feel good. And I, I enjoy the stories in games. And this, of course, already had a great story. Uh, but this is where now I'm going to get into the spoilers. But overall, yes, I do recommend this game. Definitely, definitely play it. Enjoy it. Definitely play the remake. Go get Crisis Core. Play them all. Uh, these are great. Uh, the gameplay is fantastic. I love, it's, it's a mixture of action and a role-playing game. The characters are amazing. The acting on the voices is fantastic. I appreciate them so much. I even appreciate the... Um, motion capture actors in Japan. They have some kind of Japanese style gestures that they do that you might see in an anime a little bit. That's kind of fun to see. It's a little different for us here in the in the States and probably some other places in the world. But I, I appreciate the acting is so good. And the animation on the faces is so good, which might be part of the motion capture as well. The expressions. Uh, you, it's... It's like, yeah, these are fictional characters, but you feel like you're going on an adventure with these characters. They feel like your friends and... Uh, and that's I'm going to get into that later, how you, you, you feel like you've, you really build a relationship with these characters. You the, each one affects you, although Yuffie, I, I still she annoys the dickens out of me. I really do. I do not like Yuffie, uh, but I'm, I'm glad I'm not alone in that. Um, she's like that. And if I had an annoying kid sister, she would be the one. Uh, and that is one of the things I can appreciate, appreciate about Aerith is Aerith, you can tell the rest of the party kind of gets annoyed with Yuffie. But Aerith just likes her. Aerith can can just like everybody and anybody. There's there's more lessons for you that she, you know, even the people who just annoy her, she puts in the effort. It's like, you know what? I'm going to be your friend. Uh, she she will just put in the effort and just be friends with people and just loves on people. Uh, lesson learned, okay? She's she's really a good Christian example. I had a, even a, a guy I was talking to. I just kind of met him on Facebook, and he referred to her as a holy warrior. And I was like, that's very true. But anyways, uh, the... All right, here's where the spoilers, if you haven't played this. they really, And it's introduced at the end of Remake, but there is kind of a multiverse element to this. Now, I have seen there's someone on YouTube that's like, oh, no, that's not a multiverse. And they've got like over 2,000 views on that. I'm like, okay, well, I'm curious what your opinion is, but I, you're you're wrong. I mean, they totally did in the uh, multiverse where one action, where it was like one main timeline, but one singular action has, as it, it mentions Rebirth, that you alter fate and now all these possibilities have sprung to life and are like active different worlds of what, how things could go. And at the end of remake, Aerith kind of uh, uses, well, Sephiroth has already done it because Sephiroth in the worlds and timeline he's in, he's failed. He wants to find a way that he wins. But now of course, because it's the whole multiverse concept and you know, this is 2024, you know, a good villain doesn't want to just destroy the world. They want to destroy the entire multiverse. You're right. <laughs> so that's what he's, he's now up to do, but you see at the end of remake that he goes to alter his own fate because he wants to win in the end. Aerith follows suit and kind of bursts a portal type of thing that they all go through, giving them all a chance to alter fate. Now in the world, in the end of remake that they go through, you kind of see in in a fight with Sephiroth and everything that Midgard gets pretty destroyed. At the, as we open up with rebirth, we see Zach now, now alive and bringing cloud with him, carrying him in, when he was supposed to have been murdered by a platoon, well, not murdered, he dies in combat at least, uh, but he dies to a platoon of Shinra soldiers. Uh, and we see him not having died there, and he continues on and goes into Midgar, but Midgar is wrecked, and they're blaming it on tornadoes because nobody can see this, the whispers, and now I'll, I won't explain the whispers necessarily to you right now. Uh, but we see that he's in that world that they have been altered at and broken, but somewhere along the way, they have now exited that fate, and they're back in their their main timeline, and Midgar seems to be standing if you ever get a chance to look at it because uh, there's time they look over and they can see the Shinra building still standing, even though you can see Sephiroth destroying that building. And even I think he throws it a cloud at some point if I remember in some of the cutscenes. So where where the main characters are at, Midgar is still standing. But where Zack is coming in in this altered world, everything's different. They have not left Midgar. Most of them seem to be dead. Aerith is alive but in a coma. He brings Cloud in with Mako poisoning himself. Uh, and so the only characters he's really get to interact with is an unconscious Aerith and a uh, out of his gourd gone cloud. And neither one of them is appeared to be conscious. But Zach has his own side story that we get in there. But it's showing how like, there's a different world because you get all that at the beginning of the game. And then all of a sudden we, we jump back to the main part in the area and calm. And Cloud is giving him the given his version of what happened five years ago. Uh, slightly distorted, but he does not realize that. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the 97 game will know that he's got a distorted view of history. And that's kind of important. Do we know? 
so, I mean, that's kind of the main elements that we get now into the 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 end of the game and everybody's got their theories on what's happening and this is where okay there there's your spoiler warning now i'm going to read my notes that i have here uh, and they deal with the end of the game so here's your chance to stop the podcast play the game and come back okay you've been warned right so Aerith, of course seemed to be aware in the remake game of her future and Sometimes seem to be somewhat accepting of it that she might have to make the sacrifice in order for the flowers to speak to us. So there's different things that pop up. Um, but there's also times she talks about she wants to be able to alter her fate. Now, the whisker seems to have taken away her knowledge. In fact, her holy materia, we get to see at one point that's supposed to be white that she keeps in her hair that she got from her mother is now clear. Now, materia is something we know that holds them the knowledge of the planet and the ancients and whatnot. And this is supposed to be one that's this holy material has been passed along, I guess, through the Cetra, and it has all the knowledge, and, and, and she was able to have that knowledge as long as she had it, but she's lost all of it. It was taken away by, apparently, the Whispers. Now, those of you who played the 1997 know that Sephiroth actually was, was pushed into the live stream, and is still there. He's kind of trapped there, but he's got this ability to possess anyone that's, that has these Genova cells in them. And we see these black robe characters from, you know, the 97 and these game. And whenever he needs to, he can become one of them, which he did in remake as well. Now, if you're not aware, Cloud has some of those Genova cells when he got experimented on after the event five years ago, which is why him and Zach disappeared. Zach, they couldn't really do anything with the uh, Genova cells because he'd already been bathed in so much Mako had to become a soldier an actual member of Soldier. Cloud does not realize at this point he never made it into the Soldier program, so he didn't have any... He was a normal guy, so uh, Hojo felt free to experiment in any way and gave him Genova cells, but then bathed him in Mako as well. Uh, so he has been enhanced, so he's got his own powers. But he's basically trying to create like almost a clone of Sephiroth, but there's all these people in the Soldier program that are have a little bit of Genova in them, and they've become now these black robe individuals that don't really have their own consciousness, and they're all just under a Sephiroth thing, and any one of them could become Sephiroth at any time. Uh, but let's keep that in mind. Sephiroth is able to do that. Now, I, I've heard other people mention out that Aerith, when you get through this, seems to be stopping Sephiroth in multiple universes. There are multiple versions of Aerith that we seem to see in one particular scene. And she seems to be aware of all these different things and is coordinating her efforts to stop Sephiroth. In fact, at one point we see a version of her give Cloud a an actual holy material of white, which Cloud then gives to the version of Aerith that he's been in in his world, now setting her in motion to where she can move forward. She gets all of her knowledge back and she knows what to do. Uh, and of course, those of you familiar with the game, you're going to be familiar. Uh, so now Cloud, the, the, so it's very interesting. You see as he goes to the final scene where Aerith is about to meet her her fate, that, of course, the Whispers uh, whispers trying to keep fate and keep things rolling on the way it all is supposed to happen. Once again, you see the, uh, that there's a way by, by saying Aerith's name, they're able to, like, they call to Aerith. She's, it's like a portal gets opened up, and all of the, uh, the party are kind of holding this portal open, allowing for Cloud to go through as Vincent Valentine tells Cloud, she needs you. Go. Now, we get to see a lot of different things happen with this multiverse idea and anything that seems to happen in, in Aerith's favor, there's almost like this rainbow of light, this prism of light that kind of goes along when something happens that, that shines around those choices. We see Zach making choices like that and cloud making choices and, you know, and her making choices where this, there's like this burst of light. Well, when he goes in and I, this is, I, I've watched the video again while I was making the videos that I've mentioned that are on YouTube, Neverland gaming channel official or search for the spider pan. That okay, so when, when Cloud gets in there, and now as you know, remember you'll remember at this point in the game that Sephiroth is trying to force Cloud because he can he's got some control over Cloud, and it's even worse. Some of the things Sephiroth makes Cloud do, he kind of like gets possessed throughout the game up to this point. But Cloud is there like holding a sword over her, and it's like Sephiroth's trying to force him to kill her. This time it seems the the whispers are tr are are circulating around Cloud's sword, like they're trying to push him and make him strike her down. In the cutscene that happens, you see this, like there's this burst of rainbow prism light around Cloud's sword when he sees Sephiroth coming down and he seems free and we see him stop the blow of Sephiroth coming down. And we see the sword, uh, Sephiroth's sword being knocked away. And so it seems that Aerith has not been killed. But now, 
Cloud is getting like that seems to be Cloud, you know, as he stepped through another portal like they did in a remake. It seems that he might have stepped into another world and was able to interfere, but he's getting ripped back into his own timeline again. So he's getting ripped to an area where she doesn't where he fails to save her. And so he's living in a world where she's dead and all the other companions come along and they see her as dead. But he, uh, through some of the adventures he's had through the multiverse, the, due to Aerith taking him to different realms and Sephiroth is tracking him and trying to show him what the reality is really like, he's he's now has an awareness of a multiverse. He seems to be able to see that there is one version of Aerith, at least, that he saved her. And there is some an interesting bit where they have changed the ending of remake to where instead of Aerith saying, uh, I don't like it uh, seeing the sky, you know, that I, I miss the steel sky is what she said. But now she's saying that she doesn't like the sky. And she tells Cloud in the world where he he pops up with her at one point in a multiverse. It's basically the Cloud that's been Mako Poison and the version of her that's been in a coma. They're in a world where Sephiroth has won and the, the meteor is coming and everybody's kind of resigned themselves to fate. They can't do anything. And you can see things in the sky. The sky is kind of split. And sore, but she, Aerith tells them, don't look at the sky. You won't like it. But it's the sky that Aerith seems to have been able to see all along. Now, granted, everybody else is seeing great blue skies, but she sees all universes, apparently, and has seen this broken sky. Cloud, at one point, he does indicate that he sees it, and he tells the others not to look at the sky. But he seems to be able to see through the multiverse and see all the multiple things, which I... Seems Sephiroth is very aware of of all the multiverse and all the different possible potential fates. Um, so he seems to be able to see Aerith, but nobody else does. I think he is seeing her in another world, but she kind of knows that she can't go along with them anymore because it's just going to cause confusion. And she tells Cloud at the end that she's going to stay and continue her prayer to, to fight Sephiroth and, re- and repel the meteor that he summons with the Black Materia. And uh, there's this very touching moment where they fly away on the tiny Bronco plane and she just says goodbye at the end of the game. And it's like saying goodbye to us. And there's even times when she uh, she tells Cloud and when in this alternate world, she gets to go like a little date thing and they go to have some fun. And she says, it's been fun. But the thing is, that she, she you see her actually push Cloud through a portal at that point. And you see Sephiroth coming in behind her at that point. But so it seems like that that version of Aerith was meeting her fate earlier. Um and that we even get some uh, some shots with Zack where it seems like a lot of Aerith's destiny is tied to Sephiroth killing her. And Seth, de- or Seth, sorry, Zack's destiny tied to being killed by a platoon of Shinra soldiers. But we get to see a version of Zack escape. We have see one where he defeats and he carries off with Cloud. He defeats them. We've seen that Zack all throughout the game. But we see another version of Zack where he gets confronted with that uh, that platoon and he escapes. So it seems like we could have a version of Zack that is alive still in a world that's functional. And Sephiroth's goal is this splitting world. He wants to bring, bring them back together. And he says stuff, and there's a big multiverse fight that happens with him after Sephiroth's apparent, or I mean, after Sephiroth apparently kills her, kills Aerith. Uh, we see a Zach who says like, so these worlds can be brought back together. So if they can be separated, they can be brought back together, huh? And he seems to have thoughts, and maybe Cloud does too, that we can bring these back together with a world where Aerith is alive. And we could have a mega happy ending. That is what I'm sticking to, that we could get this mega happy ending. And we have a version of Zack and Aerith that are alive in this multiverse that we can bring all our fates back together. And we could have a great, what I call the Legend of Zelda happy ending. Because that's what Legend of Zelda games always have happy endings. And the Final Fantasy VII of the 97 just kind of comes to an end. It's kind of like, oh, look, there. We see the spirit of Aerith and all the live stream comes to save us from the meteor. And then we skip up to like 80 years later and we see Nanaki or Red 13 with his children or his pups, whatever you want to call them, uh, going to see the force having reclaimed Midgar. You know, it just kind of ends. I think we could do more for an ending because they were able to develop a lot more with the characters. We could do a big mammoth ending in the third part of this. So I'm really excited for the potential. But that, that of course, now is my theory of what I think happened. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to hashtag this Aerith lives, man. Now, I'm not the only person that thinks that, but there's a lot of people who think, you know, uh, they refer to Cloud as the unreliable narrator because we see that his mind, his memories are all messed up. And he seems maybe with trauma situations to not deal with it very well. And perhaps him seeing Aerith alive is him not dealing properly with the trauma of her being taken away from him. Uh, I can't go along with that, although apparently so the developers have said stuff. There's a book written in Japanese about the development that's been being translated. And there's some people talk about they did think about how trauma affects people and tried to include some of that. 
But we remember Cloud's memories are messed up in the past, not what's happening now. Although he seems to be able, he was able to get glimpses of the future after being in contact with Aerith in the remake game. But he seems also he's seeing multiple things in the in the time where Sarah Sephiroth comes to kill her. He is seeing so much different stuff, and there's a lot of like flashes and everything of what has happened with her. Uh, or you see him saying stuff, which they recorded lines of what he's supposed to be saying, but they took them out. Uh, I did see some stuff online where they've translated from the developers have said what, what Cloud is supposed to be saying at that time. But a lot of people have gone out of theory that, that he is un, an unreliable narrator. He's seeing her, but uh, it's all in his head. Other people have theorized that what we're getting is an Aerith like force ghost of, of some sort, that perhaps this is her version from the live stream, and for some reason Cloud can see her, uh, but it's, it's a dead version of herself like a force ghost, and she's still interacting. And some people even thought that, oh, well, this whole thing, this is... They they somehow another put time travel involved, and you got a Sephiroth and an Aerith that is post the Advent Children movie, which you can watch on YouTube, by the way. Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. It is an entertaining watch, uh, and it does try to resolve stuff. And you see, actually, almost a baptism in water that that uh, Aerith has caused. To, that's the healing for this uh, weird disease that somehow has happened due to the events of the game and stuff like that. Um, but they think that you know this is a version of Sephiroth from that and the Aerith from the live stream of that. Some of another time traveling back into this to continue the battle to make sure Sephiroth has stopped for now. His worst plans have set just the world. He wants to destroy the entire multiverse because he's trying to create worlds where he succeeds at destroying the world with a meteor because he wants to wound the earth so he gives over the power to make a god of himself. Every one of the god complex is going to be put down. I'll tell you what, because there's only one god and uh, he doesn't dress like that. Okay. Uh, so, but that is uh, like the, the the reigning theories that you're going to find online. There seems to be three major ones. I know what I'm sticking to. I'm sticking with Aerith Lives, but you know what? We got to wait like three to four years for the next game to come out where we really find out. And uh, so, if you've come along with me, I'm a, I'm presuming that you've played the game. If you get every recess point in the game of the of the show, and so I haven't spoiled anything. If you haven't played this stuff and I spoiled it, I did warn you. But it's time to wrap up this show. So, of course, remember to go to thank you, go to, well, go to neverlandpodcast.com, uh, where you can find, of course, the podgagement, Dubby. You can join the Neverlanders and choose yourself a nickname because Lost Boys have to have a nickname. And you can be a pixie because girls are too clever. They don't get lost. We want to thank Karen Kennedy, Ricky Pope of Christian Nerd United, and Darren Will Height of the Will Height and Wall Show for helping me out with the introduction of the show. Go to, pod, of course, send an email, podcast at neverlandpodcast.com. We are on Twitter or X at Neverland PCast. I've mentioned, of course, the Facebook fan page where you can click like or join the group and actually engage in the discussion, and I can share uh, more news and different things that I find uh, with you there if you join the group. But that's where I'm going to wrap up the show. Thanks for coming along with me, and now get lost in an adventure. We'll see you next time. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy.